Amen. Praise God. And then we have Janice, Nicholas, and Stephen Grohovic. How many remember that? All right. <laughs> they have been here longer than I have. That's a long time. Amen. They haven't been with us, uh, been with us for a while. I understand, you know, according to Facebook, Janice can tell you more, but, but uh, Nicholas got first place. Is it the county for wrestling in his weight class? So that's fantastic. And his brother Stevens, quite the athlete as well. I'll tell you that. You know, he has, a, has some great accomplishments. So praise God. And of course, these young ladies right here, the you know, cream of the crop, right here. The, praise God. And all of you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get in trouble again, right? <laughs> okay. Moving on. We need the opportunity to worship in giving as our ushers come at this time. And I did want to mention to you, I did send out a text to you concerning our desire to upgrade our microphones and purchase some cordless mics uh, for the praise team. You responded beautifully with your with your commitment to to give to that cause. I think some are giving today. You can begin that process. In fact, we have a couple of sample mics today. I have one. Kelly has another one. We're looking at both of them, and uh, we'll make a decision on which way to go with our purchase. And we'll try to to do that this week. And you know, I'm not going to mess around. We're going to do it while you're saying, "Yeah, we want to give." I, that's when we need to go ahead and, and do it, right? Before you change it, not that you change your mind, but now's a good time. So uh, thank you for that. And of course, if you're not prepared today, that's fine. You know, in the coming, uh, the next few weeks, if you could, could uh, give what you feel like you, that you'd like to towards that project, that would be wonderful and awesome. I know God will tremendously bless you. Before we do receive the offering, I do have some announcements on the screen. Uh, yes, right there. Thank you, Bob. Great job. And uh, so we're looking forward. March 28th is Palm Sunday service. And uh, that's exciting. That's the last Sunday before Easter. And uh, that would be great. And then Sunday, April the 4th, is our Easter service, which is Easter, 11 a.m., with communion. Hey, we're going to have communion. Does that sound exciting? So we purchased some of the pre-filled cups that have the wafer and the juice and everything all in individual cups for you. So it's quite sanitary. We're going to leave you in your pews where you are. And uh, that'll, be, that'll work out very well. And then also we decided to move forward with the annual Easter egg hunt following the service uh, for the kids. And uh, they'll have those picked up outside in the yard in about five minutes' time. I'm sure, no matter how many we bring. Uh, so please bring in your candy-filled eggs. Uh, start that right away. And uh, that will be wonderful. You guys can discuss. Ladies are always good about that, discussing how many would be good to bring. I don't know. I, I, I do have my dozen already pre-filled that's how I go. That's how I roll. Buy them pre-filled. I don't have to deal with that. So you can do that or you can fill your own if you prefer. Amen. Praise God. We're looking forward to uh, the coming Sundays. So with those announcements, we're going to give the opportunity to worship and give it. Bob. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to be in your house again today. We ask that you would touch your people, touch this offering. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.
Praise the Lord. Wow. God is in this place. And uh, we're happy that you're here. Those of you that can join us here in the sanctuary and on Facebook Live. Our text today is in the New Testament. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 John, chapter 3. I reference this particular passage just in just in passing. Uh, last Sunday in my message, where Moses says to God, please show me your glory. I want to remember that. It's been a week, right? So I mentioned that. So this is kind of a continuation of that thought, but dealing with this passage of you and of me. Specifically, our theme today is children of God. That's who we are, children of God. This passage deals with the transformation you and I will experience when we rise to meet Jesus in the air. We will be glorified together. And we shall be forever with the Lord. First John chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Heavenly Father, we just approach your throne of grace today in the name of Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that your word would touch our hearts and penetrate to our very heart and soul. We pray, Lord, that your word would be a source of revelation and inspiration. We pray, Lord, that we might have received the ministry of your word and the Holy Spirit when we leave this place today. And we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen, amen. Before you're seated, just do a, an air high five towards somebody or you know, wave or something. They, oh, it's great to see you. But just in the air, right? Okay. You can do a hug if you want. Okay, I'm going to hug all of you right here. That's something. All of you at the same time. Children of God. So it begins in verse 1 with this challenging word, behold, which is a word that we don't use a whole lot. When I'm out with you and we're in conversation, I don't use the word behold, right? I go out for lunch with Pastor Bill and Carol, for example, or Joel and Kelly. I don't, when my food comes, I don't say, Behold, my food is here. It's a word reserved for getting your attention, right? Behold me. Hey, hey, this is really, really, really important. This is really important. Demands your full attention. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. And so I want your full attention this morning. And God wants your full attention. Because you know how it is, how distracting 
everything could be. Things going through, through your mind. Some of us not quite as quickly as we used to, but they still go through our minds, right? Right. Things that have happened in the past, things that are going to happen later in the future, today. I sure hope he gets finished by a certain time, because, man, I need to get somewhere, right? Thoughts like that go through our minds. Or, once I'm done here, I've got this, that, the other, and tomorrow's work, and the next day, it goes on and on and on. So we're distracted. And it's just fine. I mean, I'm delighted if you have your cell phone with you and you're following along the scripture. Not so good if you're following Facebook other than this particular live stream or something else, right? Praise God. So we do get distracted. So we want to focus for the next few moments of time on what God wants to reveal to us. Behold, and here's what we want to think about. Here's what we want to focus on for the next few moments. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. Who can express the love of God that he has bestowed on us or he has granted to us and he has poured out upon us, has extended to us? The love of God. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Consider that. Consider the love of the Father that he has granted to us and poured out on us, bequeathed to us through Jesus Christ, that we should be called children of God. Isn't that amazing? So much love He has shared with us, granted to us, extended to us, bestowed upon us, that we have, can be called now children of God. King James has sons of God. Most translations, children of God. But there is a an inference there, I think, that there is a distinction there in that I believe what he's trying to say to us by using the Greek word that often indicates sons rather than children in general, but general, but children can be applied here, is the right of inheritance. In Bible days, most of you are aware, normally it was the firstborn male that would inherit the double portion and would become the head over the family clan. In Jesus Christ, all of us, men and women, and boys and girls, receive the right of inheritance. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God, whoever male, female, whatever, having the right and authority of the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. We all are heirs of God. We all are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. In that sense, we are all sons of God. Here, children of God in this translation. Children of God with this distinction, the right of inheritance. 
the right of the firstborn. Jesus is the only begotten of the Father. We share equally with him. So that we should be called the children of God. Back to our text in verse 1. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Don't be surprised if they don't realize what we're all about, right? How many, having experienced what it was like to be lost in your sins and not know God, and then have come to know Him, how many can say this morning and agree with me, I, I understand that before I came to know Jesus, I had no idea what that means. I had no idea what that experience is like. Amen? I'm not hearing any amens. But that's been my experience, right? No comprehension. Everybody awake out there? Let's see. I seem to be open. Okay. But we have no idea what that's like because that's, that's you know, something that's spiritual that we didn't experience before. What an amazing revelation. When we come to Jesus and our sins are washed away, amen, by the blood of Jesus Christ, when we are born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, what a revelation it is for our eyes to be open and have an understanding of what it means to know Him. And not just as servants, but as children of God. Suddenly everything becomes clear. The truth is revealed. Why we're here. Where we're going. What our purpose is. is all about being saved through Jesus Christ. Understanding this life is only temporary. Understanding that eternity waits for us. Understanding that God made all that there is. And by coming to Him through Jesus Christ. And being born again by the power of the Spirit. Becoming children of God. Uh, secures our place in eternity with Him. Verse 2, beloved are those that are in, those that are loved by God. Now we are children of God. Emphasizing that point. Understand that you are a child of God. You are a part of the family of God. As such, you're not a beggar. You're not someone who's trying to plead with a family that's well to do and you're on the outside looking in. Your role is even more than a servant would experience. Remember the story of the prodigal son and how, of course, he was the right, he was one of the rightful heirs to the inheritance of his father. But he decided one day that he was going to go out on his own. And he comes to his father and he says, give me my inheritance. Even though it wasn't time for that yet. You know, let's divide it up now. And his father did that. And the son goes off in a far country. The Bible says that he squandered all that money, which was considerable, in riotous living or partying. So that it was all gone. He didn't have any way to feed himself. And so he began to work for someone who raised pigs, raised swine. Which a fine Jewish boy would never do that <laughs> ordinarily. This Pigs weren't on the list of acceptable things for them to eat. The pigs were a symbol of impurity. He wakes up, he has nothing, he says, you know what? I'm gonna I'm tempted to feed myself with the husk that these pigs are leaving behind from their grain. That's how desperate I am. 
I'm going to do this. Here's my plan. I'm going back and beg my father to take me in as a servant. And he went, and you know the story. He went, and his father came out weeping and hugging him. And the son tried to say, Father, I, I sinned against God, I've sinned against you, and I don't deserve to be a son anymore, but I, I'm just asking you to take, take me in as a servant. His father would have none of that, right? Being a servant, he said, in my father's house would be a lot better off than where I'm at when he was back with the pigs. Good news, my friend. We are more than servants. Servants have a good, a good place, relatively, in a large house. A well-to-do family. But that doesn't begin to compare to being in the family, being a son or daughter. And that's what you are, more than servants. You are children of God. God is your heavenly father and mine. And like a father, he loves us and cares for us and provides for all of our needs. Beloved, now we are children of God, so understand that. So whatever you're going through, I'm just taking a pause here. Whatever you're experiencing, just remember that. You're not an outcast. You're not even a servant. You are a child of God. You can come boldly to the throne of grace, according to Hebrews chapter 4. You can come boldly to the throne of grace in time of need and find the help that you require. Amen? Because you belong to God. You're his child. He will not turn you away. We are children of God. Has not yet been revealed. Verse 2. What we shall be. What does that look like? Oh, we have some idea. I referenced again last week. Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration perhaps gives us some idea, but only in part. But how many recognize, and I mentioned this last week as well, I think I'll just go back and preach the whole sermon over again. Does that sound all right? No. Yes, I did reference last week, Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, and they were beheld that limited glory that he revealed. But I hope that you recognize when Jesus comes again for us, when the rapture his church, he will be revealed in more glory than on the Mount of Transfiguration. More glory than anyone has ever seen him. As we rise to meet him in the air. But it's not been revealed when we shall be. The exact the exactness of that is something we have not experienced yet. We have been born again by the power of the Spirit. We are children of God. On the inside, we're no longer the same. Aren't you glad you're no longer the same? You're born again by the power of the Spirit. The transformation on the inside has already occurred and is in process. It's a process of continual growth and maturity, hopefully, in our lives as we access one level of glory to the next, to the next. But these bodies have not been changed at all. But that's going to come to pass. Notice what he says. It's not yet been revealed what we should be. None of us have any idea or clue. But we know that when he is revealed, when Jesus Christ is revealed in all of his glory and splendor, we shall be like him. Transform as we rise to meet him in the air. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 49 through 52. And as we have
have borne the image of the man of dust. In other words, like Adam. Human bodies. We shall also bear the image or be in the likeness of the heavenly man. That would be Jesus. We're going to be like him. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, as we now know it, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does corruption, that which decays, that which fades away, inherit in corruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Woo. Amen. We shall be changed. So again, it's not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. We shall be like him. He's the first, the first fruits. He is the God man. He is the He is God who was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I'm talking about Jesus. John writes in John 1 and 14. Amen. That same Jesus. You know, when Jesus was ascending up to heaven, that final, you know, time when he when he was able to speak with the disciples and he begins to ascend, then there were two angels standing near. By, and they said to the disciples, why are you gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus that you're witnessing now go up into heaven will come again. He will come again. The same Jesus, amen, is coming for us in all His glory, in all of His splendor. And we don't know what that's like yet, but we know this. We know that we shall be like Him. Why will we be like him? The final phrase says, For we shall see him as he is. That's why we're going to be like him. So let's unpack that. What? 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 Why is that true? I share with you last week. So this is a continuation of last week's message, part two. Jesus said, no man has seen God at any time. We can't see God. We can't see Jesus in all his glory and splendor. Not, not in these bodies. Not the way they are now. How many know that would kill us? But here's something awesome that's going to happen. Whether in the grave or for among those that are still alive or made on the earth, as we rise to meet the Lord in the air, we will be changed. And we're going to be like Him. Because we're going to see Him as He is. Won't that kill you, Pastor? No. No, it's an amazing thing. As we rise to meet Him in the air, the completion of being glorified will take place as we rise to meet him in the air. Seeing him in all of his glory will bring that to pass. Remember, I mentioned the disciples on the Mount, Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. That, that didn't change them. That was quite a revelation. I, wouldn't that have been something to be there when Jesus was transfigured before them and they saw that radiant glory coming even from his clothes? And Wow, that was something. Didn't change them, though. Not their bodies. Even Moses, you know, when he came down off the mountain, his face was glowing. I know the Bible doesn't say so, but I'm convinced, I know you believe me, that didn't remain to be the case. That went away, Right? It was not glorified at that moment. But here's the thing. Jesus is coming back in all of his glory as he rides to meet him in the air. 
We're going to see him as he really is. Coming into the presence of Jesus as he really is. It's not just going to, it's not going to kill us. It's going to transform us. It's the final step. Now it's true. If he came to the earth and revealed himself in all of his glory to those around us who are lost from their sins, that they would die. We would die too if it wasn't the right moment. But God has a plan that as we rise to meet him in the air, being in his presence in all of his glory and splendor is going to complete the process of transformation for us. You're already in that. I mean, you've already started on the inside. You're working your way out. How many know that? On the inside, nothing happens on the inside. Forget it. The outside is not going to change. But if things are going on the inside and you're being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside, you're progressing with God on the inside. When you rise to meet Him in the air, now you're going to be transformed on the outside. Because you're going to see Him like He really is. In all of His glory and splendor. And that's going to transform you. To be like Him. I shall be chained, oh hallelujah. Remember that old song. I shall be chained some by and by. When the dead in Christ shall rise to meet Jesus in the sky, I'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye. I shall be changed, oh hallelujah. I shall be chained some by and by. When the dead in Christ shall rise to be Jesus in the sky, I'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye. You're going to be changed, amen, by the power of God as we rise to meet him in the air. Because we are children of God. How much love has he bestowed upon us? We should be called children of God. He wants us to be with him forever and ever. This is not the end. This is not all that there is. This is just the beginning. Amen. Amen. Don't let this moment's discouragement overwhelm your life. Amen. Don't let these the problems of the moment take you into the depths of despair and despondency. Frustration or fear, anxiety or stress. This is not all there is. This isn't all that you have to look forward to. This is just the beginning. You're in the process, even right at this moment, of being transformed by the power of God Almighty. Amen. You will be changed. You're already in the process of change on the inside. On the outside will be that final step. That day is coming. That moment is coming. That moment is coming. Jesus is going to return for His church. Amen. Jesus is coming for you. This is not all there is. God God is with us uh, for the moment. God blesses us each and every day with his bountiful blessings. Our God is good. Our God is great. Our God is awesome. And this is not the end. This is just the beginning. You have a glorious, wonderful, inexpressible future. Eternity is countless. It's forever and ever and ever and ever. And after a few hundred years, probably less, everything we experience in this life will seem like it was just a, a second. Won't it? 
And after a few more hundred years, maybe you won't even hardly think about this life. It'd be so far removed from your experience. Because we're talking about forever. That's how much God loves us. He wants us to be with him forever. And he has a plan and a purpose. And people could just see. I want you to sense this morning. I want to experience also the urgency of the moment. People need to know how urgent this moment is. Jesus is coming. And Satan does not create everything, but Satan uses whatever materials available against us. And we live in a time Well, I'm having not experienced previous periods of time, but only my lifetime and you yours, but it just seems to me like, from my personal experience, that things today are just so accelerated. There's so many things going on in people's lives. It's not calm and relaxing. How many can say amen? Most of you are going 100 miles an hour all the time, and then you just kind of collapse into the bed. And then you don't sleep then, necessarily. You're tossing and turning. There's so much going on. If you have kids, my goodness. Janice, if you have kids, <clears throat> I mean, school is so demanding. There's so much going on with you know, school and sports and all that stuff going on. And even though your kids are grown, there's just a lot going on in your life. There's a lot going on in society. I mean, the news just keeps coming out. Boom, boom, boom. It used to be, you know, you could go weeks and not anything significant happen in the world. But now it's like all the time. It's hard to keep up. I mean, it's hard to keep up. There's so much going on. So in the church world, churches are greatly affected. It's hard. It's always been hard, but it's harder than ever to persuade people to come to church on a regular basis, to plug in and be involved. Because they have so much going on. So churches have to adapt, which is fine. Churches adapt. We do what we have to do. The Bible doesn't say so, but it used to. We had two services on Sunday. That's not a cardinal rule. That's not a God rule. You must have two services on Sunday. But I remember when we used to, right? I'm not suggesting we go back to that. I'm all tuckered out after one. So, you know, two, I'm not really up for that. So, because I believe you can accomplish what you need to. I can give you the words you need to hear. And we can just pray all we need to all that because you know how the one service is. I hope you understand by now. If you've got to go, just go. You don't have to wait till we close with prayer. But we're not going to stop until I feel like, we feel like God is finished with that service. We're only going to do one service. We're not in a big rush. I'm not going to try to beat everybody else to the restaurant. Amen. <laughs> Things change. You have to adapt. That's not a, a huge thing. But what is more concerning than that is that for whatever reason, and one of the reasons is because people are so busy People in churches, it's hard to get commitment to get involved and to be a part of it. Because all that's going on in the world 
and their life. And if you want to talk about sinners, good luck with that. I mean, that's even worse because they are really busy too. The only way people come to church is not because I, am, I don't have anything else to do. I am so bored. What can I do? I think I'll go to church. No, they have to purposely and intentionally, just like you have, made a decision. I'm going to church today. Because it's not like you have nothing else to do. Let's be honest. Raise your hand. Are there other things you could have been doing right now? Yeah. And so getting people to make that commitment is, is difficult. It affects the church. A lot of things affect the church. Not only that, not only the time constraints, but being bombarded all the time with what's going on. I mean, there's never been a time. Thank God for technological advances. I thank God that we can use Facebook Live right now. But those trade-offs with the advances, people also are bombarded in their homes, you know, with cable and satellite and all that stuff, and they can watch things they could never do before unless they would risk being seen by someone else. And they wouldn't take that risk now. You can watch whatever you want to. Nobody knows. Unless you tell them. Some people are bold. They go ahead and tell them. You know? No, I won't get into that. You'd be surprised at what some ministers want. But anyway, be that as it may. I'm not going to go down that road. But we're dealing with that. You know, we're bombarded by the, by the media all around us. You know, Everybody you know, has a TV, Most everybody has cable or satellite or something, you know, in your home. And then you've got your, of course, everybody has internet just about. And so you're on your laptops, your computers, your phones, whatever. Even on your phone. You can take your phone and connect with all that's going on, good and bad. All of this is happening. Sin has never been more openly practiced than today. It's all around us. People are not embarrassed or ashamed anymore. Amen? And so we're dealing with all this. And so it's understandable if people's focus is not on eternity. Even people in the church. But there's nothing more urgent or important today for us to think about and focus on than this truth. This life is just temporary. Yeah. And the one that's coming, eternity, is forever and forever and forever. And so as believers, we must grab hold of the urgency of the moment. To make sure that we and our families and those that we love are experiencing the right priorities and making that a priority and pushing towards the mark of the high calling, as Paul says in Philippians chapter 3. Because God has a plan. And we're in the process of that plan of being transformed to be like him and to spend eternity with him. And that's coming. And that's forever and forever and forever. So my call to you today is let's make sure we're ready when he calls. Eh? Let's make sure we're focused on that. Lord, oh Lord, transform me. Oh God, last week we prayed, oh God, show me your glory. Please show me your glory. Amen. This morning I want you to pray with me that not only that he would show and reveal his glory to us, but that we would regain that urgency of being glorified together with him. That we would regain that urgency of making that the priority for us and our family, for those we care about, and for those we don't even know because there are so many people in the world that are lost without Jesus. This is the moment. This is the time. 
This is the time. Because Jesus is coming. Will you stand with me today? I want us to be ready to rise to meet him in the air. You know, that could happen before the service is over. <clears throat> Jesus can come. us know how long we have on the earth if it doesn't come. I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now. Let's just pray and agree together. And we're going to prioritize God's plan in our life. Oh God, not only show me your glory, let's pray, but, oh God, let your glory be revealed in me. Oh God, I want to be where I need to be in this process of being glorified. I want to be where I should be in this process of being glorified. Lord, I want you to transform me on the inside like I need to be, so that when you call, I can be transformed on the outside like I'm going to be. Amen? Hallelujah! 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 Oh! Oh God, right now! Touch us, oh gosh! If you're hearing me by Facebook Live or in the sanctuary, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're not comfortable with that, that knowledge of that relationship, now is the time. Now is the moment. Just ask Him to come into your heart, your life. We'll agree with you in prayer. But even if you don't want to do that, just on your own, just say, oh Jesus, uh, save me from my sins. Transform me by your power. I want to be your child. I want to belong to you. I want to be a part of your family. I want to get on board with your plan. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, oh God, touch us. Oh God, reveal yourself within us. Oh God, minister to our hearts. Fill us with the fire of God, the anointing of God. And oh Lord, may we reach out to those around us. Will you join with me in this prayer now as we pray? Oh God, help me, Lord, that my household, Lord, is going to be ready to meet Jesus. Help me to be that witness I need to be, that example, that role model, Lord. And I just pray, oh God, for all my children and grandchildren, oh God. I just pray, Lord, for every relative that you would, Lord, reveal yourself. Hallelujah. That you would save them from their sins, oh God. And I want you to join with me as we pray for your neighbors uh, and your co-workers. Oh, God, we just pray right now for our neighbors. Uh, we pray for our co-workers. Uh, we pray for those that live in our community. Uh, we pray for those who live in our state. Uh, we pray for those who live in our nation. And we pray for those who live in our world. Uh, oh, God, save the lost as never before. Oh, God, uh, touch and minister to hearts everywhere. Oh, God, use us to be a part of your divine purpose. Oh, God. Be glorified in us, oh, God. Reveal yourself to us. Reveal yourself through us. Reveal yourself to us, oh God, to minister to our hearts. Reveal yourself through us, oh God, to minister to others.
imprisonment. Don't leave the wanting. Psalm 23, verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's received by faith the word of the Lord. Whatever you need right now, just believe it. Just believe it. God is moving. God is moving. We declare, O oh Lord, you are our shepherd. We shall not want. I receive. I receive. I receive right now in Jesus' name. doing some awesome things. He's going to do some awesome things in the future. He's going to bless us. His blessings upon us. Expectation should be a part of our attitude and our heart. God, we expect that you are doing great things. Amen. We expect because your word declares and your spirit conveys this truth that you are blessing us and you will continue to bless us. You are the awesome God. We expect, oh God, we expect, we expect to receive from your hand. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh God, right now in the name of Jesus, as we leave this place, I just pray you would be with each and every one. May we walk in victory. May we walk in power. May we walk in freedom. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. Greet each other before you leave. Have a wonderful day.